Hey there, everyone. I wanted to address a common question that I would usually get, and I don't think that I've actually done a video on this, even though I have done videos on other NMR material, and that is the splitting of peaks and really understanding why when we use proton NMR, we get these peaks that split into doublets, triplets, quartets, multiplets, things of that nature. So why does this occur? And how can we explain it? So I'm really going to go into some of the detail regarding that in this video. Um, many of you probably know the N plus 1 rule, and that's what you refer to it as. But we're going to take a slightly deeper look and then sort of backpedal that so that you understand why the N plus 1 rule is there and why it exists. So let's get started. All right. What is NMR splitting? So this is a phenomenon that's known as proton-proton coupling. And essentially, when you have protons, they're going to act as their own little sets of magnets. So, for instance, when you have protons, you can draw them almost as little arrows, okay? And their orientation is going to be scattered all over the place. And then, when you put the protons into, or I should say the nuclei, I'm using that term interchangeably right now because we're talking about a proton and a mar, okay? But when you put the nuclei into... A magnetic field which we represent as B naught this is the NMR instrument they all come into alignment with the field and they can pick one of two options they can either be spin up with the field and being aligning with the field is lower energy or they can become spin down and oppose the field and that's going to be higher in energy all right so when you bring them into this field, they go into alignment in one of those two situations. Those are the options the nuclei have. Now, when you have, let's use a, a molecule here. So we'll use a molecule that looks like this. CH3, CH2. Let's throw a carbonyl in there to split it up. And another CH3. Okay. So I want to focus on this portion right here at the moment. Right. So when we have a CH3, right, all three of these protons are going to be considered identical to one another when they're in the magnetic field. So when we look at these, they're all going to give rise to one signal. Okay, now that signal will integrate to three because there's three protons but it will still show up as one sig signal now that doesn't mean it's going to just be one peak okay that's why we have to look at the neighbors to understand splitting but these all come in and resonate at one signal now the CH2 has its own two protons here okay and then we have the carbonyl that comes further down here these are their own unique set. They are different from the three protons that make up this methyl group here, right? So these will also give one signal, and that signal will integrate to two because there are two protons there. So hopefully you're following along with this so far. Now, how do we determine triplet, quartet, things of that nature, right? Well, we use the N plus 1 rule, which is that you take the neighboring number of protons and add 1, and that's what you would get. So, for instance, for this methyl group, and I'm going to switch colors here, for this methyl group, okay, we have 1, 2 neighboring protons. So if N is 2, right, N plus 1, so 2 plus 1, is going to be equal to three, All right? And so that makes this appear as a triplet. And then if we take a look here, we have three neighboring protons for the methylene group, the CH2. So one, two, three. So that would be three plus one equals four. That means that we would get a quartet as that one, All right? Now, why is this actually happening? What's going on here? All right. Well, 
take one instance of this molecule, right? Because we've got a whole bunch of them. When we fill up the NMR tube with our sample, even though it's a little sample, there's going to be billions upon trillions of these molecules that are in that small amount of sample if you consider Avogadro's number. So each of them is going to have their own set of spin states when they come into alignment with the magnetic field. So we're just going to take one at random. All right? Now let's look at the CH3 at first and why it ends up as a triplet. So the CH3 has three protons and therefore three nuclei associated with those protons. So for the sake of simplicity, we will put them all in a spin up state. Okay, so the particular instance of the molecule we're looking at right now, the CH3 has all three of its nuclei in a spin up state, right? Now, the CH2, its neighbor, could be in one of several states. The two protons here could have both their nuclei in a spin up state. It could have the first nuclei in a spin up state and the other one in a spin down state or it could have the first one in a spin down state and the second one in a spin up state those would be equivalent situations so i'm marking them right underneath one another and then you could also have one where you've got them both in the spin down state right so in a case like this this would be the lowest energy option this would be a mid energy option and this would be a high energy option right and they all have these different orientations that they could take now statistically speaking we would find more in the mid energy option simply because there's two different combinations that can occur there. So there's more spin state options available in that mid energy option than in the low and the high. And as you continue to expand the number of protons present, you're going to find this to be larger and larger. So your outskirts will have the smallest probabilities. And as you move inwards, you're going to have lots of varying spin states that you could potentially choose from. And we'll see when we do the CH3 that we already start expanding. So when we, I'm sorry, when we do the methylene, the CH2, and we analyze the CH3 for its spin states, we'll, we'll understand that. So take a look here. You've got these three options. That means that the CH3, okay, now be patient with me while I switch colors, the CH3 could have a neighboring CH2 in this spin state. It could have the CH2 in a neighboring spin state that looks like this with the mid energy, or it could have a neighboring CH2 with the spin state in the high energy option. So look at those three colors. You've got three different options, right? The CH3 stays in that state, and then its neighbor could occupy one of three different coupled spin states along with it. And that is what leads to the splitting. That's why this is a triplet. There's three different options, right? So because these are mi basically mini magnets when you're looking at the nuclei, right? They get brought into alignment with the large magnetic field, but these magnets all have different energy levels. And so they exert a different influence and a different chemical shift, essentially, by just a hair on these CH3 protons. And so that's why you end up with a signal that would be a triplet. So you're going to end up with something like this, right? And the middle peak tends to be higher than the other peaks. And that's because of, again, the statistical probability that we're going to see here. And you can actually look up these ratios. They follow Pascal's triangle. So if you ever look up Pascal's triangle and you can see the way that it splits down and it does its pattern, that's the same thing that happens when you've got these different spin states. But anyway, this is how you recognize that, right, as we're going along here, we've got a triplet. Let's say this was at 0 0.8 ppm, right? This splitting, okay, is due to 
the different neighboring spin states, the coupled coupled spin states that occur between these two when they're linked. All right, so then let's go ahead and take a look at the next set, which would be, now we wanna examine the CH2. So for the CH2, in this, again, particular example, okay, the CH2 is going to have two, like this. And then we're going to examine the CH3, and the CH3 is going to have its varying states. So we could have up, 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 right? And then we could have the one up, two down option. Actually, I'm gonna do two up, one down. Sorry about that. So we could have two up, one down. Okay, and you need to pick the varying options that we would have here. So you've got the one on the right, the one in the middle, the one on the left being down, as you see there. And then, because we're kind of ranking this by energy, you could have two down and one up. So now we have only one of them that's up and two of them that are down. Okay, down, up, down and then down, down, up. And then we could have all three down, right? So again, this is going to be three up. This is going to be two up. Kind of looks like video games, right? One up. And then this would be with none of them up, right? Three up, two up, one up, and zero up or none of them. And these are the different spin states that could occupy the three protons. And so because of that, I think you can see where this is going, all right? I outlined it a little more clearly with the colors last time. I'm, for the sake of time and wrapping up this video, I'm gonna go ahead and show you this. But these two, right, could be in reference to this, 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 or this. And so because we have four different potential neighboring spin states that could influence this set, magnetically speaking, we end up with a quartet as the option, right? And that would be for the CH2 that appears. So this is what happens with the signals. Now, this is also why the N plus one rule exists, because every time that you're looking at the number of neighboring protons here it's two here it's three you always get one additional set of spin states right so if i have a ch2 there's two neighboring protons i always have three neighboring spin states if i have three neighboring protons i'm always going to get four neighboring spin states so this leads to a situation where if n is the number of protons, all you have to do is add one to those number of neighboring protons, and you will get the potential number of spin states that the neighbor has. And therefore, you can figure out how many different splits you would expect based on that coupling. All right, and then the CH3 here, if we were to take a look at this carbonyl, because we're talking about the protons, influencing additional protons, then this carbonyl has zero protons. So zero plus one is just one. So that means this will appear as a singlet, okay? It is just its own signal. It does not have that influence from additional protons that are on the next carbon. So that pretty much explains it, okay? Now, how is this useful in solving and determining structures from spectra? Well, once you understand how to implement the N plus one rule, you can figure out based on splitting patterns, looking at an NMR, what potential peaks are appearing what, next to what other potential peaks. So you can start putting things together. And if your structure shows the expected splitting pattern, then you know you have a potential match, but the splitting pattern has to match the structure that you are proposing. If you find that, oh, I should have a triplet based on this structure and none appears in the spectrum, 
then you know that that's a problem. All right. So hopefully everybody found this useful. Remember, you can subscribe to the channel. You'll get updates. We're trying to update very often nowadays. And leaving a like if the video helped you will always help the channel. You can hop, hop over to chemcomplete.com and we have our website live. We offer free resources over there. We offer services, including one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And if you check the description, you will find all sorts of links and other ways that you can help support our channel so we can continue to bring you high quality content. So that does it for this video. Thank you guys for learning with us and we will see you next time.